said what? <laughs> the media said Joe Biden's president. Ha 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 Last thing before we go tonight, that is Kenneth Copeland, diehard Trumper, megachurch preacher from Texas, whose line of work has made him a very wealthy man. He got a lot of attention a while back for buying Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, which he said he needs to get around to his global ministries. Then a year ago, he took on the coronavirus, and it didn't go well. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Standing in the office of the prophet of God, I execute judgment on you, COVID-19. Oh, I execute judgment on you, oh. Satan, you destroyer, you killer, you get out, you break your power, you get off this nation. I demand Amen. judgment on you. I demand, oh. I demand, I demand a vaccination to come immediately. Yes. I call you done. I call you done gone. You come down from your Amen. place of authority, destroyer. You come down and you crawl on your oh. belly like God commanded you when he put his foot on your head in the Garden of Eden. You will destroy through COVID-19. No more! No more. No more. It no more. is finished. finished. It is over. And the United States of America is healed you, and well Thank you. again. So reality check, that was roughly a year ago. You know the rest, over half a million dead. But please note, shouldn't everyone have an Ed McMahon-style hype man at their side? Since he mentioned God, however, and this being holy season, we hope you don't mind if we say thank God for the vaccines, which actually do save lives each and every day. On that note, that is our broadcast on this Thursday night with our thanks for being here with us. On behalf of all my colleagues at the networks of NBC News, good night. Now, Boca Raton. Here's Johnny. And here we are sitting here doing here this for you guys. Do our work. No, we're delighted to have uh, your expanded schedule on the Tonight Show, and we look forward to continued increasing success with the Vic Chemical Company. And Ed, yes. I heard some news today that I, I found rather fascinating. I understand that the Vic's people have uh, come up with a new toiletry product that uh, they're pretty excited about. I haven't heard much about it. What, well, what is it? it's called uh, Dismiss. Dismiss? Yes. Uh huh? What, what is that? It's a feminine hygiene product. Holy crap. <laughs> You're it, putting me on. No, no. Dismiss. It'll be advertised on our show. How about Vagigo? <laughs> That's a, not yes, a bad name yes. for it. Along with an other How line about of... about Cuntaway? <laughs> Someone else has that. Ah. Sterling drugs. How about Fuck Off? <laughs> Possibly. Yes, I like that. I like Formula 44, NyQuil, Sinex, Victors, and Lavoris. All the other fine products, oh. along with Dismiss. Oh, fuck Off would be a bummer. <laughs> Is that going to be a live commercial? I was wondering if you'd like to demonstrate. <laughs> I certainly would. But strawberries and lemons, I you pass a fruit stand, you get horny now. Good sales. Dismissed. Anyway, welcome Jesus back again, Vic. Christ. Chemicals. <laughs> so embarrassed to do this. Dismiss. Oh. <laughs> so embarrassed. This week in COVID history. As we head into April 2020, President Trump is a ratings hit. Mr. Trump and his coronavirus updates have attracted an audience of 8.5 million, roughly the viewership of the season finale of The Bachelor. That's not me talking. That's literally what the president tweeted, <laughs> word for word. It was weird. Did you know I was number one on Facebook? Number one on Facebook. So, Mr. Number One, how do we beat this pandemic? Maybe by wearing masks. The CDC says it's a good idea. With the masks, it's going to be... Uh, 
really a voluntary thing. You can do it. You don't have to do it. I'm choosing not to do it. Great thinking, Mr. T. Who needs masks when you have tonight's sponsor? Hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine. Hydrochloroquine. Hydroxyquinolone. It's unbelievable and totally untested. We have purchased 29 million pills. We're sending them to the hospitals. We're sending them all over. There are signs that it works on this, some very strong signs. But don't just take his word for it. Everything shows that it works. I think this is the beginning of the end of the pandemic. I'm very serious. I think history will judge who's right on this debate. I bet on President Trump's intuition on this one. Yes, our president knows best. What do you have to lose? Take it. Oh, my God. Can you believe that? And it, it, it actually happened, even though it's made to look like it's some old comedy, Willie Guy. An immigrant came to our shores nearly 50 years ago and brought destruction with him. Destruction wrought by stoking fear of all outsiders, except for himself. His name is Rupert Murdoch, and he's the most dangerous man to ever cross our border. He built an empire out of fear and lies, ruling over a network of deceit that made him a billionaire, brainwashed millions All those people in the back are fake news. with un-American propaganda. But now, the very source of Rupert Murdoch's power will become his downfall, because America is watching. And while this incident appears entirely unrelated, it is in many ways a reflection of the political moment that we find ourselves in, regardless of the culprit or the motive. And I want to talk about that political moment. The Democratic Party has shifted to the left, to some extent, but the mainstream of the party, including its left flank, operates squarely in the realm of reason, facts, reality. Meanwhile, the difference between the mainstream Republican Party and the conspiracy adult far right has essentially vanished. Indeed, over the past few years, we have reached the point where people who believe that Democrats are Satan worshiping cannibalistic pedophiles are embraced by a Republican president, as well as elected officials in his party, fueling their delusional conviction on January the 6th that they had the right to assault our capital and attack our democracy. There's this new book about the Republican party that tries to explain what happened, how it is that the right descended into, quote, crazy town. The author points out that well before the rise of Trump, even as far back as 2010 and the rise of the Tea Party, you could be a total moron and get elected just by having an R next to your name. And many such morons were. The author continues, compromise, that wasn't their thing. A lot of them wanted to blow up Washington. He goes on to say that many Republican members of Congress were just thinking of how to fundraise off of outrage or how they could get on Hannity that night, adding they didn't really want legislative victories. They wanted wedge issues and conspiracies and crusades. The author goes on to say that the GOP was infiltrated by wild eyed crazies backed by a Fox News obsessed with kooky conspiracy theories. So who is this author? Some liberal leftist Trump hater? Nope. It's former Republican House Speaker. John Boehner, in his new book, an extract from which is in Politico today. Boehner is positioning himself as the voice of reason, a wine-drinking, cigarette-smoking, old-school Republican who can't stand the new breed that's taken over. Take it from me. You'll never know where you'll end up. That's freedom. I'll raise a glass to that any day. P.S. Ted Cruz, go fuck yourself. 
John Boehner wants us to pine for a simpler time where Republican politicians were not conspiracy theorists or actively working to subvert democracy, but rather simple, hardworking corporate stooges who would literally distribute Big Tobacco's campaign checks on the House floor, as Boehner did in 1995. The problem with Boehner's attempt to separate himself from this new class of Republicans is that he literally helped usher them into power. Boehner thought he could manage and use the Tea Party to his benefit. As one former aide of his said, he thought of himself as someone who was of the Tea Party mentality before the Tea Party was a thing. And back in 2009, Boehner effectively threw in with the Tea Party, appearing with Michelle Bachman, the Marjorie Taylor Greene of her time, at a rally at the Capitol in front of thousands of far-right Tea Party protesters, who were an early manifestation of the Republican Party's more conspiratorial and dark future. Boehner thought he could ride that Tea Party wave, just like Paul Ryan thought he could ride the Trump wave in 2016. For them, the Tea Party and the Trump base were a means to an end an injection of energy that could help them stay in power. And the reason we are where we are today is because these old school Republicans, quote unquote, didn't stand up to the crazies. They embraced them, however uneasily. And now the crazies are ascendant. And John Boehner wants to be celebrated for calling them crazy. For now, finally calling it like it is. Well, too little, too late. And that brings us, unfortunately, to Matt Gates. The other day, the current House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, called the allegations against Gates serious and threatened to remove him from a committee, if true, which isn't much, to be sure, but at least it would be an expression of disapproval. But Matt Gates should have been dealt with long before these latest headlines. Gates is exactly the type of elected Republican that John Boehner claims to so disdain. A man who has always cared more about getting on television and inflaming the base than getting things done. And it's, not like, and it's not like there haven't been red flags. We now know that according to CNN, Gates showed nude photos of women he said he had slept with to lawmakers in the Florida House. ABC News reports some women referred to him as Creepy Gates. And he was part of a group of young male lawmakers who created a game to score their female sexual conquests. The Daily Beast reported that Republicans have been waiting for a Matt Gates scandal to break and that more than a half a dozen lawmakers have spoken to reporters about his love of alcohol and illegal drugs, as well as his proclivity for younger women. We didn't mention that when we had the co-author of that piece on last night because we wanted to give Gates the benefit of the doubt. But now there's new reporting from The New York Times as well, citing text messages, receipts and interviews that Gates allegedly took the mood-altering drug ecstasy with women that he allegedly paid for sex. It seems almost impossible that Kevin McCarthy didn't have some inkling that Matt Gates was a disaster waiting to happen. Yet McCarthy did nothing, just like John Boehner did nothing and Paul Ryan did nothing. And so the Republican Party got Trumpier and Trumpier, crazier and crazier. That New York Times report on Gates is absolutely shocking. It alleges that Gates, who is being investigated for potential sex trafficking involving a 17-year-old girl, and another man, Joel Greenberg, were involved with multiple women who were recruited online for sex and received cash payments. One of the sites they allegedly use is called Seeking Arrangement, which helpfully explains the difference between a sugar baby and a sugar daddy, if you needed to know that. Gates has denied sex trafficking in any relationship with a 17-year-old and calls the allegations against him, quote, totally false. He also says he never paid for sex. His office issued a statement reading, Matt Gates has never paid for sex. Matt Gates refutes all the disgusting allegations completely. Matt Gates has never been on any such websites whatsoever. Matt Gates cherishes the relationships in his past and looks forward to marrying the love of his life. If you want depression, doom and despair, vote for sleepy Joe Biden and boredom. You know the great thing? I always say someday these people, look at all of them back, look at all those cameras. You know what I say? Someday. They're going to get smart. They're going to endorse President Trump. Because if you had Sleepy Joe, then nobody's going to be interested in politics anymore. That's going to be the end of that. During his re-election campaign, Donald Trump repeatedly tried to paint Joe Biden as the boring option. But that sounded pretty good to a lot of Americans who voted to elect Biden by a margin of over 7 million votes. And you know what? Boring really isn't that bad. Here we are on just the 73rd day of Joe Biden's presidency. 
And even though COVID cases are again spiking in states across the country, this time there's a plan. Biden has communicated the importance of waiting to reopen the country and the need to keep wearing masks. And today we saw a record number of vaccinations, nearly 4 million. There have been 20 million shots administered in the last seven days. That is all great news and a huge improvement on Trump. The US economy added over 900,000 jobs in March, the most since August. And we've talked about this at length, but Biden's infrastructure plan that he announced this week would actually help a lot of ordinary people. For one thing, the president's plan would replace all of the country's lead pipes and service lines, dangerous infrastructure flaws that predominantly affect communities of color, such as Flint, Michigan. Trump always talked about improving the country's infrastructure, but Biden is already executing a plan to make it happen. Sleepy Joe. Hmm? America is also re-entering the world of international diplomacy as Biden tries to undo Trump's many catastrophic errors abroad. The New York Times reports that the US and Iran have agreed to indirect talks on returning to the nuclear agreement that Trump scuttled, something that would make the entire world a safer place. Look, there is a lot to still hold Biden accountable for and a lot more he needs to get right. But he's already proved that boring isn't bad. In fact, the exact opposite. And that matters. As former President Barack Obama put it. With Joe and Kamala at the helm, you're not going to have to think about the crazy things they said every day. And that's worth a lot.